I ask the question or I, I want to uh, focus on the role that credit ratings and debt management play in the analytics of government. Now it's one thing to talk about promoting development based on human dignity, but it always will come down to battles for public space autonomy, political discretion, and in essence, one's fiscal and economic sovereignty. Credit rating agencies and the debt management uh, requirement falls to a few agencies. I focus a lot on the credit rating agencies. I also want to include the International Monetary Fund. And what has happened is that a certain kind of prevailing governmentality, or rather a, pre a sort of kind of common sense has set in, where if countries do not strive for investment grade, do not strive to reduce their debt to GDP ratios, then they can be considered as not engaging in correct and normal budgetary conduct. Now, who are the authorities? Who, who, under whose authority is, or is normal fiscal conduct falling under? And you find that that authority is ceded to credit rating agencies largely. They come up with a set of scores, political score that looks at trying to estimate or quantify political risks and institutional effectiveness. And we know that this cannot be quantitatively done. It involves qualitative judgments, but the ambition is to come up with a quantitative score. Then you've got a quantitative score for economic uh, growth, economic strategies and prospects. Then there's more a fiscal score that looks at fiscal flexibility and the, your debt burden. Then an external score that looks at your international liquidity. And then, of course, your monetary score, which looks at monetary flexibility. And I argue that the methodology is so employed by credit agencies and taken up as facts are actually resting on a very dubious set of methodologies that actually are quite uh, susceptible to serious inconsistencies and bias. Indeed, attempts to synthesize the quantitative risk and the qualitative uncertainty in order to render a, 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 a rating remains a fallacious practice. Now, when I say that, people's eyes glaze over. I don't think we under, understand the epistemological confidence of the modern risk order. I don't think we understand, for example, that ever since 1970, when the Nobel, when Nobel Prize of Economics went to a group of uh, economists from MIT who dared to posit that it is possible to calculate uncertain futures, that a certain kind of halo was put around this whole notion that you can as it were, uh, calculate risk, calculate uncertain futures, reduce it to a probability score, and employ engineering, mathematics, and so on, and come up with ways in which you could, as it were, uh, uh, calculate risk. Now, every methodological department at any major research organization, anyone that does any exposure, has any exposure to research methods, knows that what the credit rating agencies do is highly ambitious at best. I dare to say fallacious. They know they cannot teach their graduates those techniques and expect them to get an A grade. It is not possible to quantify what is qualitative. That, I, I can't put that in any simpler. You cannot measure with any precision against peers what is political uncertainty what is institutional uh, ineffectiveness? I could argue there's great uncertainty with the Euro project, and therefore come up with a metric that makes Greece, Italy, Portugal, and so on, appear high risk, and, and so on and so forth. But what does that actually mean for budgetary governance? When we accept as natural 
the scores coming from credit rating agencies as a, a scientific and estimable um, calculus. But what it does is it sort of problematizes budgetary governance in that national governments are supposed to respond to not only investor needs, then they're also supposed to respond to a custom so, customary social pacts to do with protect, providing a protective response for vulnerable groups, providing corporate welfare for fledgling entrepreneurs, providing welfare for the indigent, and so on, promoting things like uh, in the Barbados case in the Caribbean, for example, is universal access to health care, universal access to education. And these kinds of provisioning allows for why in Barbados is scores highest among most developing countries in the area of its human in, uh, development index performance. Uh, Kofi Annan once referred to Barbados as punching above its weight, using those scores, using how it, how it is estimated under the HDI, but it's estimated highly in the Human Development Index rankings largely to do with the way budgetary governance has long traditionally worked. However, because finance is no longer the servant of economies, indeed no longer the servant of the world economy, but its master, its master, it is of course the master of the world economy now because there's more by way of rates of return for investment through uh, uh, engaging in financial games. Uh, there's more by way of governments, sovereign, you have sovereign governments going to capital markets for infrastructure loans, which puts them, much like households, into a debt situation that forces them to engage in normal, responsible conduct. A normal, responsible conduct, as determined by the credit rating agencies and the fund, is privileging the interests of investors and bondholders and so on above those of society. So this battle for, for policy space right now is being won by a very narrow financialized elite. So all the transformation that you want and the developmental that you, uh, developmentalism that is required that drove the development path for many developed countries is circumscribed because the state is being asked to play a particular kind of budgetary governance role that is always about servicing finance sector-led growth models. If you're not into finance sector growth models, then you are at risk of being deemed a default risk. You're at risk of losing investment grade. Barbados only recently got a triple notch downgrade for failing to, as it were, reduce state expenditure in the direction of cutting the custom provision of universal goods. So some policy recommendations coming from my report, from my uh, um, essay. I argue that we need to engage in international campaigns for reforms of credit rating methodologies and techniques. Now I'm saying we should do this as first order, largely because the methodologies don't seem to apply to first world countries. The core countries, well, the United States got a, a downgrade about two, three years ago, but doesn't, that doesn't stop the United States and many major country, countries from estimating their own, from pursuing their own development path regardless because they're powerful enough to so do. So we need to challenge their uh, methodologies and techniques. Another recommendation is that uh, since small island states are at the front lines of climate change, and since small vulnerable economies are recognized by the World Trade Organization as uh, systematically important to, to review and look and consider, I think consideration should be given to the implications of graduating a subset of small states to middle income status because once they've graduated to that status they no longer have access to concessionary finance and are forced to go to the bond markets and the capital markets and then be on that merry-go-round in relation to trying to please a narrow financialist elite. 
And thirdly, this is something that I think we need to busy ourselves with. The world has changed. There are many uh, uh, centers of power. And China, Brazil, and a number of countries are engaging in all manner of uh, funding or financial arrangements without necessarily requiring a trespass into the public policy autonomy of countries. We need to move beyond the Paris Club mode of governance and intervention to so-called assist and look at what those other models that China and others represent. I'm talking about the best of those kinds of negotiations between sovereigns and the non-traditional, non-Paris Club partners. Thank you.